Thank you for attending tonight's event. For the consideration of performers and other concert attendees, please silence your cellular devices and refrain from leaving your seat during the performance. Be sure to attend the other events we have programmed in the future as part of the Creative Arts Series provided to you by the Linda Berry Stein College of Fine Arts and Humanities. Thank you. Mozart, and what's interesting about this piece is when you hear it, if he didn't repeat the G up the octave after the first motive going to the F sharp, you would have had almost a nine note row, which would have been more like the second Viennese school instead of the first Viennese school. So it was, and in parts of it, you'll hear this, it won't sound as much, it'll sound like Mozart because Mozart's brilliant, but you'll hear the relationship between non-tonal music that comes 150 years later compared to what you're gonna hear now. And you'll, you'll hear that. So, and as we know from reading about Mozart and researching Mozart, he was a, he was an improviser of the highest order. And he, he, you can rest assured that he was experimenting in ways that he didn't write down for the time period. That's the first thing. And the other interesting part about this piece that, uh, that I think might surprise you once you hear it. How many of you have been to a, a, uh, a wedding or sadly a funeral and you sign the book right? And you sign in. Or if you go to a party and you sign in. Well, Mozart went to, it was a, uh, it was a, it was an event honoring a fellow named Carl Emanuel Engel. I needed to try to keep that in. And what he did, this entire gig movement, he just scribbled it out and he wrote the entire thing out as an honor to Carl Philip or Carl Emanuel Engel. He just wrote it out. He scrabbled out the lines and so the way we would sign our name in a book to say great wedding, happy birthday, Mozart said 
this is nice. You've had a great career. Congratulations. And he wrote this entire thing that you're about to hear out. And then he said, got to go, and went back to where he was. So without further ado. Remember to turn this off next time I do this. The next piece is the Toccata by Carlos Chavez. He's a very important Mexican composer of the 20th century. And one of the things he most importantly did was he promoted new music. He spent a lot of time in the arts community of the Mexican people. He was close friends with Diego Rivera, the painter and muralist, and Diego Rivera's wife, uh, Frida Kahlo. Uh, the Toccata is one of these seminal pieces in our literature because, for lack of a better way to put it, a serious composer wrote something for percussion. It, and so this piece means something. It's also a very interesting piece in that the group has to speak to each other rhythmically and they function as a, as a moving organism that seems like six parts, but it's one big unit moving along. So, and Takata, for those of you that may or may not know, it means touch piece. So the subdivisions of the piece move along and each player touches as part of a holistic unit. Uh, what else? Uh, one other thing was Chavez was very, very close friends with the American composer Aaron Copeland to the point where when Copeland would go down and have his pieces played in Mexico, he was quoted as saying, ah, I'm somewhere where everybody loves me and I'm a superstar. 
literally, because American composers didn't get that kind of love. So this is the Chavez Toccata for percussion. And one last thing is it uses standard orchestral percussion. Nothing, no big surprises.
Many of you are familiar with this next piece, the Dance Macabre by uh, Camille Saint-Saëns. Uh, this work is often more associated with Halloween than it is with, uh, with April 13th or third or fourth week of, of spring. So, <clears throat> we've all seen cute videos of this and cute cartoons, but this is based off of a, uh, it's odd to find this out, but it's after as many times as I've played it in an orchestra, but it's, it's based on what is called plague art from the uh, 14th century and the, the charming and ever virulent Black Death that uh, so many people got to experience. <laughs> ah, Europe. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Clements, did I go too far? No. Oh, okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we have a rule in one of my class, in my music history classes, that if I might have gone too far, they, they go. <laughs> <laughs> my analogies can be a little out there on occasion, but hopefully they get the point apart. But it was plague art, and this was designed the same way dark humor is, is to get us past our fears. We, make light of what terrifies us. And that's what they were doing during this terrible time of the bubonic plague. And uh, it came about from a poem, and I'm not gonna read you all of it, right? But uh, here's a little bit of an excerpt from it. And it, the poem is by a fellow named Henri Cazalis. And uh, my French, I, got, I think I get the Henri, but the other may have been suspicious. But it, the poem reads as this, tap, 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 death rhythmically, taps a tune with his heel, death at midnight plays a gig, tap, tap, tap on his violin. And in the original, and you'll hear it played by Sidney, she's playing the primary violin part. Sanson wrote it as a song, it was written as a song not an orchestral piece first, and then he arranged it for solo violin and piano, but it was written originally as an art song. And now most of us know it as an orchestral piece that's played at Halloween Pops. Uh, there's oftentimes cartoons with this and such. Uh, and if you look at some of the plague art, you will see some of the old woodcuts that have been designed. If you've seen the dancing skeleton by the Disney Silly Symphony, all of that imagery comes from 14th century plague art, actually. <laughs> so as they say, there are no original ideas. We're just stealing and making it our own. So anyway, we're gonna do Dance Macabre. It's fun, and one interesting tidbit about this piece is I didn't have to do a lot of arranging. They wanted to do this piece, and I'm like, yeah, let's do this. but in the midst of all the versions of it, this is a version that was originally arranged for accordion choir. So imagine what you're about to hear played by 30 or 40 accordions. <laughs> we won't do that.
This next work is by the Mexican-American composer Ivan Trevino, who's a wonderful marimba player and a fabulous composer. Uh, this was originally, originally written as a marimba duet for Ivan Trevino and his professor Michael Burrett at the Eastman School of Music. And then in 2013, the Eastman Percussion Ensemble was invited to go to the Percussive Art Society International Convention that's in, uh, where is it? Indianapolis. Yeah. Anyway, it's there. And uh, it, uh, it was, he, they commissioned it as a sextet. So they added two vibraphones over here with the marimbas in the back. And then uh, these instruments here. Uh, called Critales, you can hear. You hear them in a lot of movie scores. And then just some cymbals and a glockenspiel. And the wooden boxes that you all see them sitting on are called cajones, C-A-J-O-N, cajones. And give, slap it a little bit, play a little bit. One of you hear it, you hear those a lot in, uh, you hear those quite a bit in uh, <laughs> in uh, indie music. But anyway, where they came from, actually, they were designed by out of necessity because when the slave trade went through and it, and it moved from the Brazilian coast inland, by the time it got per to Peru, the, the drums and all were taken away. And those, the enslaved people started taking boxes and shipping boxes, and that's how this came about. It came out of necessity. So it uses the cajon. So this is, a, this is just a fun ride. It's called Catching Shadows.
This next tune, we will be bringing out a uh, JU vocalist, Melly Kakaris, and uh, she'll be singing Come Sunday. It's from Duke Ellington's Black, Brown, and Beige Suite. Uh, it was premiered in 1943 as an instrumental work at Carnegie Hall and Ellington's big Carnegie Hall debut. And then later on, it was recorded, he put a text to it, and it was recorded by the great gospel singer Mahalia Jackson. And one of the funny asides is she wasn't sure that she really wanted to do it working with Duke Ellington because she lived in one world and Duke Ellington lived in another world. But they did it and we ended up with this wonderful piece of music that's it's absolutely beautiful. It's a great melody and uh, let's bring Melly on. Thank you very much.
the next tune that the group will do is a piece by the Irish electronic composer Aphex Twin. And uh, he actually has a real name. Richard Davis, Richard David James. And he's very popular and he's been doing this a long, 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 long time. He started doing this, he was born in, I think it was 71. I'm remembering, I can't remember right off the top of my head, you can tell. On, was it 71? 72, my fault. Sorry, year off. Anyway, he was born in 72 and uh, he had started working on these types of things by the time he was 13 or 14 with antiquated, well, you all know what computers were like in the 80s. And he was doing all that. So he's a very clever young man. So this is Extol, and it was transcribed and arranged by our drummer tonight, Brandon Hill.
this last tune, some of, many of you probably know this tune already. Some, I had no idea about this, so, well, because I'm old and don't know these things, but I've learned some things from all the students, and that would, but I do know what memes are. But anyway, apparently there is, a <laughs> there is this video with this tune on it, but, and so it's called Camel by Camel, but it normally has an Egyptian, this animated Egyptian yellow cat dancing. I have not seen this, so I have, so you all, some of you know this, and I am completely in the weeds because I just know something exists. But it was written by this fellow, his name is Sandy Martin, okay? He's a Croatian singer and songwriter. But what is really important is he did this tune in the 80s and he made so much cash off of it, he retired. He simply retired. It was such a big hit. He just retired and said, I'm finished. And <laughs> that's what he did. So this, uh, again, this was transcribed and arranged by Brandon Hill, our drummer. And this will feature, as you can see, the last three tunes have been more pop oriented. One of the things percussionists have to do, you know, they can sit around and think about they're gonna, that they're going to play Beethoven and Mozart and Bach and all this other serious music the rest of their life. But if you want to make a living, you're going to end up playing pops concerts with orchestras. Or you'll get to say things like, welcome to Moe's when you go to work. So <laughs> that was a little dark. Sorry, <laughs> to catch myself. <laughs> ah, touched the nerve. Anyway, <laughs> in all seriousness, and there's nothing wrong with that, but what I'm driving at is if you study to be a percussionist, you probably want to play percussion somewhere. So you have to learn how to play pop music. It's very, very important. And you have to learn how to play it like a pop player in spite of the fact all you've been doing for 10 years is practicing very serious music and playing the xylophone and marimba and everything. But uh, it's good for them to have to play these tunes. And this next one brings about an old, old friend of mine, Brian Rao. And uh, <laughs> I met Brian at a church gig I used to do many years ago. And he came and he said, can I play? And he started playing. It was like, yeah, you can play all day long. And you're about to find out. You, he will shred, as they say. You're about to see the world of shred. So enjoy this. It's the tune Camel by Camel, or the Egyptian cat dance, as it were. <laughs> Thank you. 
thanks for coming out. Uh, before we retire for the evening, I would like to uh, say thank you to someone who's been with the group for four years, but they are going to go on and graduate. Yay. And they have, they're a mu they were a music minor, and they've done major work in our department. So sometimes the minors do a lot of work. And she's going on with a degree from the illustrious Jacksonville University School of Health and Nursing. She's got a degree in nursing. And we'd like to thank Caitlin Van Tyne for her four years with us. You all know that's a lot of work, and so putting the time in and doing this with us is a big deal, and it, it means a lot to all of us, and I think everybody in the crew. is happy about it. <laughs> I didn't know what happened. And if, are you or n her nursing professors up there? I don't no, know. No, those are my friends. Oh, my okay. <laughs> Nurses? Yes. All right. <laughs> Keep doing it. I'm getting older, so we're going to need the help. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, everybody take care. We'll see you in the fall. Have a good summer. Be good, and thanks again for coming out. Bye-bye. Yeah.